Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Mountaintop Motivation Podcast. Today I am here with Tony Robleski. I'm so excited to be here with you, Tony. How are you doing today? Awesome. Thanks for having me. And you nailed my last name perfectly. That's rare, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did ask you last week. Last week yeah, I did. Yeah. Ask you. <laughs> and so that 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 helped there. That certainly helped. And uh, for everyone who's listening and not watching, it is per, it is spelled L or sorry R U B L E S K I. How how do some people pronounce it? I've heard everything Rubluski, Rubalowski, and you know, here's the first tip to get going for a lot of your audiences. It doesn't bother me one bit. I, only me and them. I kind of wink at them, and I've seen some people that get introduced get really upset. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, they they brought me here. You're interviewing me. I'm grateful I'm even here. So just Tony R. I'm the other Tony R. of the industry. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I even put um, on my my intro that to be read by you know, whoever's introducing me to come on the stage. I have on there, yeah, at the top says Jake Valentine, but then underneath in parentheses, it says pronounced like Valentine the holiday, but with a B. So yeah, it, it's very, it for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, cause I mean, if they hear that, like, okay, Valentine, cause a lot of people will say Valentine. I'm not really yep. sure why, but that's where most people, not most, but many people will, they'll say, they'll say Valentine. And so I'll just say that pronounce like Valentine, the holiday, but with a B and then they go, okay, I got it. Sometimes they still don't. Sometimes I still mess it up. I think that's just more nerves and they're not reading they're, yeah. you know, What they're doing is they're reading one line at a time rather than, you know, kind of looking at it, but I do make well, it big and bold. Yeah. I think why I brought it up is the fact is that um, you're, you do your homework, Jake, and you, your attention to detail is nice. I do a lot of podcasts like you do back and forth and interview people as well. And it's nice when someone actually does a little bit of research on you. So mm -hmm. when someone actually says, how do you pronounce them? I'm like, wow, okay. Because um, most people, you know, they, they're going and going and going. So well done on doing your homework, my friend. Well, very cool. Well, th today in this episode, we're going to be talking about your first 100K year in business, which uh, I'm very excited about this interview series. We have a lot of these that we've already done. They're going to be coming up. We've got some big plans with these. Because uh, I, I just think that before we were talking about motivation, we were talking about people being inspired. And ultimately, we can talk all day about you can do this or this or this, or here's these options of the strategy that you can do. But ultimately, even though those are very important, if someone doesn't believe that they can do it, they're not going to do it. And sure. me doing these interviews is to show that, look, here's all these people who are successful and they're just people. They're just people. And uh, I'm really excited to have you on to talk about this. Cool. Well, I, I agree. And I think also too, Jake, is that um, everyone's got a unique story. And I actually say this, I have it on cards that I hand out in slides at my own keynotes is never downplay the significance of your own life story and the positive impact it can have on others. So there's mm -hmm. a little gem right out of the gate, uh, wherever level you're at, or whatever you think your experience is, your, your life story has massive value, or your story is plural. And I think so many people look up to the greats in the industry, so I could never be like that. Good, you shouldn't be like that. You can model, you should see what they're doing to be successful, but at the end of the day, you have to be you. And certain stories that you tell will connect, Jake, with people in my audience, some of my stories might connect with your audience, and some people may not get it. But there's such a huge need in our industry, especially as we're, we're taping this interview, um, coming out of COVID, like, you know, there's so much fresh talent and new people that are needed, Jake. Yeah. I, I just, so many people come in, I want to write a book, I want to do it, I'm like, please do, because the industry is going through a massive, I wouldn't say a flushing or a cleansing. It's going through an entire reset right now as we do this interview. Yeah. So, you know, to me, never let someone downgrade your dreams. I know some of these sound cliche, but they're very real. And you and I love to serve people. That's why we do interviews like this. And we share our knowledge set is there's plenty of room. There's yeah. really not competition. If you're an abundance thinker, there's five to 7,000 gigs per week live in the US alone or North America, you know, pre COVID, post COVID. We can't do them all. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. you want to kind of be able to say, hey, here's a good person on networking or social media or how to do LinkedIn. And that's why having good networks and sharing knowledge, it always comes back to you. When you got to think about it this way, you know, you, you've been in the business a long time. I've mm -hmm. been in the business uh, about seven years less than you. I've been in 10, you've been in 17. And in those 10 years, I've seen a lot of people come up. You know, I, I had, I guess I was in the business a little bit longer than that, but I've been in full time for 10 years. 
And I, I had success pretty quickly. And I, I think a lot of that had to do with, I was really hungry, uh, both metaphorically and physically uh, and literally <laughs> because I, I, I was, uh, yeah, I, w- I was just coming out of college. I was a poor college student. I mm-hmm. made a decision at that time. I said, okay, I can do what everyone else is doing by getting a job and then building something on the side. But I knew that if I were to go out and get a job, then I would no longer be a poor college student. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the transition between poor college student to poor entrepreneur was going to be an easier transition than poor college student to corporate cushy paycheck to poor entrepreneur. I thought that that would be a a much harder decision. So I consciously said, I turned down two jobs out of college and said, I'm going to dive into this. But anyway, all, I, I say that to, to say that my success was was pretty quick. I had success happening quickly, but it was because I had no choice. I put myself in a situation where I had to do the work. People say, how do you, how do you stay motivated doing it? I don't know, bills. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy. When, <laughs> it's pretty easy when um, you know, I was recently married and uh, I you know told my father-in-law, I'm going to take care of your daughter. I'm going to figure it out. And uh, well, I got, I got to figure it out. So that made it easy. But I'd have all these questions from people who are just starting out. This is before I was doing coaching and speaking and coaching and all that. It was at the beginning and people uh-huh. asked me questions. I was always happy to help. And the reason why is because I knew that some of these people were going to do great things. Some of them I'd never hear from again, but some yeah. of them would do great things. And I knew that my network in the future would be dependent on how I treated people when they were below me. So the way Correct. people treat you when you're at the same level or some of those people have gone way beyond me. You know, some yep. of those people have just had massive success. And you know what? Those people thinking about one person in particular, you know, they, these people, there's others, but one in particular, they treat me very different than if I would have been rude to them when I was above them. When I'm talking above, I'm not talking someone's human value. I'm talking about in the business. And if I'm here, someone else is here, and I treat them like dirt because they're below me, well, what's going to happen when they're above you? Well, they're yeah. not, they have no reason to treat you well. And, and success in this business comes from our network above everything else. Well, there's so much wisdom you just dropped in there. And, and I think one thing that jumps out is you're going to meet the same people going up that ladder. Sometimes you're going to be on the ladder stuck at a certain point. You're going to come down the ladder. It's called adversity, contrast, wisdom. And I feel like before we hit record here, I mentioned to you that I feel like I'm starting over again, Jake. Yeah. You know, 17 years is great. Media planners look at that. They look at the testimonials in the books. That's credibility. However, I feel like as Les Brown taught me, one of our mutual friends and heroes in the industry is I feel hungrier than ever with a new set of eyes. Uh, it's looking at saying, right, who can I really serve now? that I can get much more selective, you know, 17 years. And that's one veteran piece of wisdom that I can do now. But also my kids are older. I don't feel like I have to take every speaking gig. I don't have to jump every airplane unless I choose to. And that way it also lets the clients that want to hire me know that, hey, you're very seriously committed about this. This isn't just like, I'm going to pack it in, give a, you know, a canned keynote and just show up and, you know, wave to you and leave. Um, a lot of the business I get the last decade and a half is relational. So networking, relational, a lot of clients bring me back repeatedly. Like, look, you always come back with new books. You give us updates. You're always sharing stuff of value online with your blogs. You don't always try to sell us. You're just giving us updates. So I think a clue for any of us, whatever level listening to this is always be a resource to people. And when times are really good, it's, it's easy to stop following up and stop doing the mailings and emails and messages of value to people because we're too busy. Well, look what happened a year and a half ago almost. Everything stopped. It came to a grinding halt. And with that, I looked at it and go, wow, these relationships now, I booked a couple of gigs the last couple of days, Jake, from clients that have been with me for 15 years. Like, yeah. yeah, we've got the new book. Thanks for sending it to us. We're ready to have our meetings again. You're the first person we thought of. And I'm like, thank you. So networks, relations, it's never looking down. And again, it's been funny to watch. I could name a couple of people like you that have, I had dinner with them 11, 12 years ago. Now they're like massively huge. I'm like, Wow, what a thought. And it's hard because we're built as humans to compare. We're supposed to not do that. All the good books teach us we're not supposed to judge. The speaking business is in some respects competitive from the talent level. 
Okay. There's lots of gigs, but you see different levels of talent. They get 15, 25, 50. Um, I reached out to a speaker in their bureau yesterday to, from one of my own events, 75,000 she gets. And I'm like, damn. Okay. And that is for you. It inspired me and didn't get me mad. I'm like, okay, I need to raise my fee because I'm probably undercharging, not because I'm going to match and compare my credentials with hers, but I'm thinking, wow, that shows me that maybe it's time to up my game yeah. um, and realize my value, Jake. Yeah. No matter what's going on with meetings starting to come back online in person, um, even I need a checkup as Zig taught me from the neck up to keep raising my, my value proposition. Yeah. And that's also the strength of networks that you have and peers to say, hey, you haven't raised your fees? Like, seriously? Come on, Valentine, get with it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I think I want to go back real quick to your story, how you started. Um, that was scary, Jake, because you probably got all sorts of like, what'd you go to college for? Now you got these corporate jobs, you had the safety, but you didn't sell your soul initially. And I give you a huge kudo for that. Uh, because a lot of people have been very tempted to go, well, I want to get my my money saved and you know make my new wife happy with safety and security and I'll wait five or 10 years. So many times if you do that, you won't go back to it, Jake. Yeah. Or yeah. it's going to be tougher when you've got three or four kids with new sets of bills to jump ship. That's what I did. My kids were, gosh, eight, five, and three when I went solo. Mm -hmm. And it was terrifying. The first year I did over six figures in 10 months gross income but I was in massive action mode, like Tony Robbins taught me. I was taking every gig, every dinner, every luncheon. Some nights I'm like, okay, I need to sell 50 books in my head because I'm like, I got bills to pay. I would not recommend what I did. Yeah. But that's the entry point that I came in. And some odd reason, 17 years later, marketing, let me give you a clue, get good at marketing. I'm still in the game and still loving what I do. Yeah. Well, you bring up a good point and I'm excited to get into that, 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 that first hundred K year and we can talk about what worked well and, and what didn't, but the thing, and you mentioned Tony Robbins, absolutely. He talks about a massive action plan, you know, taking yep. massive action. And the truth is, is that if you have a good plan and you're learning from a mentor, um, you can do things much more effectively Yep. But I think that so many people overcomplicate things when they say, oh, I can't afford someone. I can't this. I can't that. Great. Go to work. Put your feet in the direction of your dreams and just start moving and working. And if you're willing to let go of the noise in your head and you're willing to put in the work, you're going to see results. You're going to see success even if it might be a little chaotic or even if it might be, well, you know what, later on, I realized it really wasn't the best way. I feel the same way. You know, I used to send a hundred emails a day or I'd make a hundred contacts. Usually about, uh, I'd make like, I'd send something like uh, around 75 emails and I'd make about 25 phone calls. And I do that every single day, every single day. Now I don't, I don't code any of my, any of my clients who want to build a speaking business. I don't tell them to do that because there's more effective ways to do it. There's yeah. more effective ways. You still got to hustle. You still got to work. You still got to do those things, but there's more effective ways of getting leads. That was all cold contacting is all that yeah. was, but it, it worked because I was willing to do something. We could call this B I S marketing. This is what it is. B I S <laughs> marketing, what it is, but in seat marketing. Yeah. If I'm just yeah. got my butt in the seat and I'm doing the stuff, something's going to stick. You know, something's going to work. It's just taking massive action. Yeah. Well, I think um, Tony's advice was, was spot on. It helped me. I'm like, okay, you know how to market. Because I came out of two very competitive industries, was successful. But I started to study some Dan Kennedy materials and I looked at it as an investment. So something I'd like all the listeners to gather is it's funny. If you draw an analogy, how we'll spend 50, 80, $100,000 to go to college. I went to university. It was nowhere near as expensive as it is now. But yeah. people walk at 1000 3000 or 5000 to invest in a skill set like going to an event, learning from a coach, going to a boot camp. And I'm very biased because I, I host my own events, okay? Full disclosure. However, when I invested like with Dan Kenny's materials or Brian Tracy's items and, and even Tony Robbins in my 20s and 30s, I always got a 10 to 1 return, Jake. Me too. And I was like, wow, I spent... No, I didn't really spend money. Rethink it, Tony. Reframe it. I invested a fraction of what my marketing degree from college cost me 
and I'm making more money in real time from real world mentors. That's a bargain. Yeah. And, and people get so damn cheap, Jake. It drives me crazy. I'm like, well, I can go on YouTube and get it for free. Well, you get what you pay for. And the challenge is we have about a nine second attention span. It's a lot of my core teaching of mind capture is we're basically the attention span of a goldfish on meth. Mm. Everyone's like, bing, 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 bing. So you can go on YouTube and you can dig around for months on end. But if you really want to do a deep dive, you find a mentor, you find a coach, you find a group or an event you go to where you can really get tough love, good and challenged in what you don't want to hear and things that you're like, okay, you're on the right path. That shaves off years. That does in the long term an ROI if you implement and take action. It's it's the, the biggest steal out there, Jake. Yeah. You and I get it. And we fumbled around. My first five years was a train wreck. I was taking every gig I could because I had three little kids and lots of bills. I'm like, holy cow, I've got a lot of overhead here. My nut was very large to, to pay off every month. And I'll be honest, I fell behind at times. I'm like, oh my gosh. So about year five, I went, You've got to get more of a strategy. You've got to go back to coaching and you've really got to get um, specific of who you want when you're doing the, the BIS work and get referrals and get marketing proof. So when you make a contact in, they know who you are. They know of you versus just picking up the phone and grinding it out like my first couple of years. Yeah. So it's not sexy. Um, a lot of people don't want to hear, but you do have to work in the best. <laughs> I wouldn't say shortcut. But the best path to reduce, reduce your curve of frustration is a paid coach, a paid mentor, going to live events. You get those working in tandem, you do leapfrog when you implement. And if you're coachable, let me warn everybody listening, even fans of mine, if you're not coachable, let me save you 5, 10, 15 grand. Don't go to an event. If you know it all, stay home and watch YouTube or go on a free group and, and continue to get bits and pieces of the puzzle. But I just get frustrated because so many people to me are hobbyists, Jake. Yes. Well, I kind of want to write a book. Kind of want to speak like you do. Kind of is not committed. There's a big switch. John Asaroff taught me this years ago. He's spoken at my events. I've been in his events as well. There's just a serious switch in your mind when you go from interested to committed. Yeah. And I, I really love what you're doing because you're, you're moving people off that. Well, I'm kind of curious. Many of them are like, okay, if Jake can do it. And the people I'm listening to, I should get committed now. It's time. And yes. then coming from COVID now, the dark night of the soul or that slowdown, that timeout we all had, there's going to be a lot of great talent coming in now, Jake. You and I see it because yes. they're no longer afraid. They're like, gosh, everything could be changed in a second. Maybe that secure job I had is not really what I want to do. I have these great stories. I'm around great mentors that can lead me. It's time to go. Yeah. So it's almost like the new age of our industry in many respects. Yes. Well, and you talk about investment, a couple of things on that. One, don't sell a product if you don't truly believe that it's the best way that they can spend that money. Like, True. so if you don't believe that, but for me, I truly believe that not only with the stuff that I do, but also because I've experienced it over and over and over again. I even, even the courses I've taken that were lousy, Mm -hmm. You still got something that was worth at least what I spent for it. You know, in terms of real dollars coming back, I don't feel like any course that I've ever purchased, any live event that I've ever purchased, I don't feel like any of them have ever cost me anything because they've yeah. all given me a return. Most of them have given me a massive return. You know, I'm, I'm doing business mastery with Tony Robbins in a couple months. Um, awesome. I, I love his events. You know, I've, I've done date with destiny a number of times. I, I can't even count how many times I've done UPW and it's just something that's so great, but I'll make this last statement. Then I want to get into the, the first hundred K year, but if someone is afraid of investing in their business and you want to be successful in your business, and we're talking about something that in the grand scheme of things, it is not very much. And if you're afraid, for someone listening, if you're afraid to put money into your business, the up, the upfront cost of building something successful, learning the knowledge, just saving yourself so much time. If you have fear around that, I want you to do some research and go find out how much money it costs to start your own Subway Subway restaurant. Find out how much money it costs to spend your own, to, to start your own Subway restaurant. You're going to realize that it costs nothing to start our business. Yep. You know, nothing. And by the way, Subway, I, I say that example because it's, it maybe not the, but it's, it definitely 
close to the cheapest franchise restaurant you can get into. I think it might be the one, but I don't want anyone to call me out on it. But it's <laughs> in the very cheapest of franchise restaurants that you can start. And it's Mm -hmm. still hundreds of thousands of dollars after you add everything. I'm not just talking about the franchise fee, but you got a location, the construction, all this stuff. You're, you're hundreds of thousands of dollars in and probably, man, six months if you're going really fast, but probably a year in hundreds with an S of thousands of dollars, an entire year before someone can even come into the door and sell your first $5 foot long sandwich. So therefore, when we're talking about putting some money down and spending three months to learn something, it's nothing. It is nothing in the grand scheme of things. All right, Tony, tell us about your first $100,000 year in business. Terrifying, Jake. (laughs) (laughs) It was the first year. Uh, It was um, 2005. The first year I got in as a full-time speaker, I jumped ship from a former employer. Long story short, it had a good ending, but we got into a battle over non-compete because I was a VP at an ad agency. He thought I was trying to take clients. I never did. But basically, instead of going to court, he just stopped paying me. So I'm like, oh my gosh, we have a new house, three young kids, and my wife going, you better get to work. So started it really under duress, Jake. And if anything, all the things I learned from Dan Kennedy and Zig, how to sell, and Tony Robbins about being motivated, massive action was like, I burned all the boats. So there was no turning back. I would speak at women's dinners at the local Rotary for different advertising groups, chambers of commerce. I went into massive action mode to do over 100,000 in gross income my first really 10 months. And that's Mm -hmm. when we had lawyers going back and forth for a few months. I was burning my savings down. And I'm very grateful to my former wife who was, you know, said, go for it. I believe in you. And I had a very supportive partner. Our, our marriage didn't make it, but you know, my kids are older now and I wish her the best. We've made amends. We get along. But she believed in me, Jake. And a lot of partners would have been like, what? Are you kidding me? You're going to do what? So I have to go back 17 years ago to give credit where it's due and also to my, my faith in God. But there was so many miracles to pull that off. And you know, many years after that, I had some years that went way above that. Some years it was down. But I realized anything is possible if you know how to market. And if you give a great presentation, the referrals that came from that, Jake, I lived off referrals and word of mouth. Now, it was a different ball game 17 years ago. There was no social media. You didn't really have as much activity online. And you you worked a lot with picking up the phone, sending out email messages. And a tip I want to give to everybody, regardless of what level you're at, is I never do a free speech ever. I do some promotional dates. Let me give you a big tip that I want to give people. Remove free from your vernacular forever. Occasionally, if it fits you and you have, you got to pay bills, you want to take the date, or it's a key group of influencers, I will occasionally do select promotional dates. To this day, Jake, if it's the right group and it's a bunch of CEOs in my target market, they say, hey, we'll cover your travel and as a date workout, we'll cover your lodging. If it's the right audience, I know I've done this several times. I can get thirty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in speaking dates right when I'm done speaking. Like, hey, we want you to come to our company, our conference, our employee meeting. And right within 30 days, I booked twenty five, thirty thousand dollars by doing a promotional date. So it's something that a lot of people miss. They think, well, I've always got to get paid. When you're starting out, you will do many things to produce revenue, Jake. And I know that's not the most sexy advice, but I have to go back to my early days of the first year and say, man, I was a workhorse. And it paid off because the business sustained. And I think, man, if I had not known how to market, I don't know if I would have made it, Jake. And I've had offers the last many years to go be VP of this company of sales or marketing or director of training. And when you have some lean years, you go, it's tempting. But I'm like, no, I, I wouldn't say I paid my dues. I took the, those risks back in the mid 2000s to be able to build a sustainable business, no matter what's going on. Yeah. Um, last year was tough. You know, 2020, the asterisk year on the calendar of the global civilization. Um, I made a strategic decision to pull back. I did some Zoom trainings, but my income went way down. But I also wrote another book, did a live event, and made some very bold moves to position now as we record this in 21 to jump out way in front and it's paying off. But, you know, I was 15 years in the business when I did that, Jake. Yeah. So it was kind of nice to have the autonomy to say, Let's pull back and think this out of how we want to look the next five or 10 years with the business. Because I love what we do, Jake. And a lot of people got out of the business, 
but there's so many more that are coming in now. And it's going to be fun to see the new talent coming in. I'm, I'm interested to see some of my veteran friends, 15, 20 year speakers that are still doing some gigs, if they're going to renew their passion. But I think you and I teaching and coaching and going on the road and, and leading from the front, they might be like, okay, I see what you're doing. I've got the spark back. And again, there's so much room in the industry, Jake. That's why we love to give our knowledge. It's like, we can't do all the gigs. So that's a very short version of the first year. And like I said, it was scary. <laughs> so with, with hindsight being 2020, what did you learn that you would do different? A couple things. Dan Kennedy, my central mentor, had said is find two or three industries that within about three to five years, you can become very well known. Now, it's much easier to become well known now as we take this in 2021 because social media. You can look up references. Um, you can Google people. But back then, it might take a year or two before you started to become known. So define and find what groups are the best match for your message. And here's one that I missed that I, I really, about four or five years later, went, oh my gosh, my life could have been easier. I worked in telecom sales for a decade in my 20s. And what I realized was those groups have great conventions and they pay really well. But I was so burned out, Jake, from doing telecom that I didn't go back to that industry till like five or six years later. And I'm like, wow, they really need my message. A lot of the speakers are very um, academic and boring and they pay really well. I'm like, geez, if I had just gone back to my roots of the language in my old world, I could have been probably much easier to pay my bills, less stress. And I thought, well, the learning lesson is go to where you're known and your familiarity. And I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, but it's easier to get a beach had to become established. So find two or three vertical markets or industries or niches that you can strategically say, look, I get a few speaking gigs in that industry. The referrals will come. I have specific industry references. So when I get on the phone with a meeting planner, I'm emailing back and forth. They already know that they're interested because they, it's a safe decision for them, Jake. Yeah. Quick example, real world, because this is how it works. I have a phone call Monday, four days out, actually it's five days out, with a meeting planner in the insurance space in their committee. I sent them one reference letter and a video from a gig I did, and they looked and said, oh my gosh, this guy is the perfect match um, because it's industry specific. It's a big event because it's their first in-person meeting, and they want to have someone industry specific. So that phone call pretty much to me is to narrow down what the theme of the event is. We've already talked about fee. It's to say, reassure to them that, hey, you've done it for other people in our industry. Can you do the same for us? That's by getting very strategic with your vertical markets. So that's a big one. Um, and also, don't forget your roots because you can speak with instantaneous authority and expertise because you know the language you were one of them. So I yes. hope that helps. I, I think that that's brilliant to say, like, look at, look at your roots, look at where you already have credibility. Like, I, I have my clients go through an exercise where they go, make a list. They don't know. They're not committing to work with these people. It's just make a list of where you already have credibility or could build it very easily. At the beginning of my career, I focused on the youth market. I, now don't get me wrong. I love working with teenagers. I, I loved it. It was a passion of mine, but a big part of that decision was also that, well, one, I was young and didn't feel like I had, didn't feel like I had credibility with real adults. Cause I was 24 at the time and felt <laughs> like, uh, I don't, what, what can I say to them where I can have some credibility here, but also most of my jobs up until that point were at, uh, summer camps after school programs. I had been working in the trenches with teenagers for years at this point. I had already been working with teenagers for years. I studied psychology in college and, you know, at one point I was going to go into, um, <clears throat> at one point my plan was to go and get a master's degree in counseling and work with teenagers. So my, my emphasis was already focusing on teenagers. So I understood them. Plus I had credibility with them because I had been working in the trenches and I wasn't like one of the, so look, a principal's hiring me who's 50 years old and they might know way more than I do, but I've been in the trenches almost like an older brother to them as opposed to the guy who's coming in from here. And so I was able to relate to him in a different way. I knew that I had credibility. So I decided mm -hmm. that's where I was going to go. So if people can start there and go, I need to start with 
where do I already have credibility instead of swimming upstream with something you've never done before? Yeah. Well, and again, um, I'm, I like to find patterns. A lot of the, the interviews I've been doing with people for the last 15 years, I used to sell CDs of interviews of the month years mm-hmm. ago. That's you awesome. Know, like, the like, podcast that's and time. Time. Yeah. Mailing out power stuff time. like that. Yeah. yeah. And people would pay me for the interviews. And what I realized was that the old patterns, I always looked for like, what is the common thread that they keep doing that, you know, the success leaves clues. You know, Jim taught Tony that and Tony teaches that to the world, Tony Robbins. And it's so imperative that when you find sometimes a mentor, when one minute or a coach can give you like one minute, like story, you're like, oh my God, that saved me five years. Or it affirmed what I intuitively knew I should be doing, but I'm like, okay, now I feel like he's done it or she's done it. Now I can do it. So just getting mentors and coaches and keeping mentors and coaches, it doesn't mean you've ever arrived, Jake. Um, I'm looking to work with a couple of new coaches in the second half of this year. They're going to be tough on me. And they're very much um, a good investment. That means they're not cheap at all, but they're going to push my paradigm to up my game and they're going to be tough on me. And and I'm ready for that because I think at different points, we can get comfortable in this business. Yeah. And I know I had best-selling books, my second and third ones. I got a little cocky. I was in my 30s. I'm like, I kind of got this figured out. And then wham, a divorce came down. And that type of event will humble you. It could be a death, a cancer diagnosis, or you know, COVID stops our livelihood. You've really got to go, okay, what am I going to do if things radically change? So to me, I don't ever want to get too comfortable. And I know when I have, I, I, it's, I don't do good work. I, I kind of be like, okay, I'll write later. No, I've got to act like a hungry rookie. Like I'm in my first year of training camp in the NFL. It starts in 2021, Jake. And with everything opening up now, I saw an email from Brian Tracy because I'm on one of his subscriber lists. The industry is starting over again. And I thought, what a great headline. Uh, those of us that are vets, yeah, we have clientele. However, there's all these new groups that are like, wow, let's look at a Jake. Let's maybe bring Jake in. Let's bring in Tony now. And let's bring in Sally Smith from Omaha, who's brand new because they have nothing to lose now from the perspective of they don't know who's really out there, Jake. If a lot of speakers left, there's a lot more coming in. And it's up to you and I as veterans of the industry. It's a high responsibility to teach and share wisdom so we all look good. I've had gigs where they're like, I have to convince them more because the last speaker in front of me was horrible. Like, bomb. They're like, well, the last speaker, I'm like, oh, here we go. I have to do a, a psychoanalysis. I have to become Sigmund Freud here and listen in my chair for 30 minutes of all their fear and say, what if we did it different? And what if I can help you to look better than that? Okay, you're hired. So it's fun. Um, I, I, I'm grateful for the internet and YouTube and these types of interviews. We didn't have this when I started out, Jake. Yeah. We really didn't have it until we went to a live event or invested in CDs or cassette tapes. Yeah. <laughs> I sound really old now, but um, it, it's just the new era that we're in. And I, I commend you for the series because I know who you know. And it's fun to have different levels of us in the industry that are going to be teaching and sharing wisdom back and forth. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I I think that's such a good good thing to look at. One thing I notice you doing is you are consistently producing new content. Yep. One thing when it comes down to it, anyone who's a speaker, they might say, well, I don't want to be a YouTube guy. I don't want to be a whatever. That's fine. You don't have to do that. But it's a lot easier to reach out to people and say, hey, I got something new to share with you. Check this out. That's Mm -hmm. much easier than to go back to them and say, hey, you didn't want to book me before. How about now? You know, I mean, it's it's not a good model, right? No, it's it's sort of the begging, like I, you know, like hey, I only want to take from you. Do you have a check for me? I'm still here. Do you want to give me money, please? <laughs> well, let me give you a great example of uh, a different approach. Okay, I mailed you like this is I'm holding positive disruption. Okay, my yep. seventh. We we're already writing this summer. We've scheduled time to create content. So July, August, September, volume two. I've laid out with our team by the age of 50, by my 51st birthday, the eve, I have to have my 10th manuscript done. And my BHAG goal, the big, hairy, audacious goal is God willing from 50 to 60, I put out 10 more books. So by the age of 60, I have 20 books done. Now I love to write. It does get funner. It gets easier. The ideas tumble down, but I have an audience now that's like, Hey, you always come up with cool new stuff. 
And what I learned during COVID is putting a book out during a pandemic, we got a lot of attention because no one was making really any moves, Jake. There was this kind of stuck, and I get that. There was a lot of great hybrid and virtual. I did some Zoom trainings, but we actually were mailing out books. Um, here's the thought, and I learned this from Jeffrey Gittimer, the top, one of the top sales trainers, okay, is you give away a lot of books. I mailed out probably 300 books between late November till even now. Part of our marketing plan, I'm looking at our marketing plan on my board, my office, we gift 25 books a month minimum to different groups. It could be the director of United Way, someone that's doing something great. I mail them a book, no expectation, no pitch. We gift books out constantly. And what's happening, I'll give you a quick example, real world. Last week, my dentist walked in my office area. There's a coffee shop around the door. I'm in a big armory building. It's really cool. I said, hey, Elias, what's going on? I said, hey, come in my office. He walks in my office. I give him two books, one for him and his wife. He goes, hey, by the way, we've got our next dental summit at the end of June. Are you available? I said, what's the date? I said, June 28th. So I give him the books and enjoy the books. He called me yesterday. My wife and I love the book. We want you to speak at our dental summit. It's six minutes from my office with a drive. You know, it's a nice payday. It's going to help. They're buying books for their whole staff. But by giving away and being alert, opportunities come, Jake. Yes. So it's something I learned from Larry Wingen as well. Don't be cheap with your books and resources. Gift them out. Mail them. Give them to, I, I donate lots of books to charity auctions because I believe in the charity. And number two, they talk about it. Someone gets the book, they go, oh my God, we want 50 bucks. It happens yep. all the time. So it's very counterintuitive, but it's also Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI. Two words, givers gain. Yes. Jake, you do it. You do it. That's how I met you. I met you at an event two or three years ago. We didn't see each other on stage. I had to fly out, but I became part of your network online and your Facebook group. I love the value you were giving. I'm like, this guy gets it. And then we were kept getting referred from Jeff McLaughlin, bearded Jeff. Yeah. Like, you got to connect with Jake, man. So we circled back, but I already knew before we did this interview, I'm like, Jake's a good guy. He gives and he gives and he gives. And I loved your content. Some of the interviews you did, I was like, man, he's really killing it by giving first. That's why we're doing the interview. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that that concept of giver's gain from BNI, that's something that I think about all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. And people are so stringent. They're so stingy when it comes to their time. They're so stingy when it comes to their resources because they think, I got to make a payday for everything that I do. And when they have that attitude, they're shooting themselves in the foot because they're not getting to the paydays. And they're yep. getting frustrated and they quit before they even get there. Yep. And I just, that I try to give two real world examples in this interview. I mean, they're street time battle tested. I can see him literally, he walked where I'm sitting around my desk, give him two books, sign them. Five days later, hey, let me want to book you. He calls me the dentist, 50 employees, but it's giving first, Jake. Yeah, hundred percent. So it, it's really cool that that first hundred K year was in your first year in business. For mm -hmm. a lot of people, it's not, it's not in that first year of business. A lot of people it takes a little longer. So Typically, I ask, well, what would what could you have done to get there quicker? It was in your first year. So that that question is null and void. But well, Jake, you know, have a bunch of kids to keep you on edge. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's, it's be hungry. Um, but I, what advice do you have to someone who has maybe they've been in business a couple of years, they're profitable, they they have business going. It doesn't matter what what industry it is, but they have their business going but they haven't quite reached that, that hundred K of, of income yet. And they want to get there. So what advice do you have if they're stagnant at a lower level and they want to get up to where, where they want to be? Well, two things. It's a great question is um, find someone to hold you accountable, Jake. Mm. Really, we're doing a small retreat here in two days here in Michigan with a small group coming in. And one of the things I'm going to teach is accountability. But at the end of the day and a half session, we're going to pair people up that don't know each other. They're going to hold each other accountable six months from the event. And that was one reason why we created this little mastermind event. This retreat was people want to be more accountable. So find someone that can be coaching you. It could be a mentor. Maybe it's your banker or your CPA. And say, look, I have a revenue goal that when I see you each quarter, every six months, let's say your accountant, Sally, Sally, I want you to bring up the first question I review is how's my revenue tracking? Or maybe it's your banker. Meet with your banker once a quarter. Okay. And they can say, hey, you know what? You're missing this. Or how's your goals coming? My banker last November, when we self-published The Positive Disruption during the pandemic, my latest book, he said, Tony, have you thought about these ways to find 
loans or find investors. I'm like, wow, he was coming up with great ways for me to sell more books by finding investors. Kid you not, one of my key training clients wants to invest in the book. He's like, yeah, because I could see it getting out to the different sheriff's departments, the different counselors. And that idea came from meeting with my banker to help expand my business. So it's not like you have to put on your credit card or take out big loans. You have clients that will invest in you, Jake. Yeah. So I think having accountability is one. Number two, something Dan Kennedy taught me. A buyer is a buyer is a buyer. Your clients have training budgets. Many times we don't ask for enough. Okay. Um, they become familiar and they're like, yeah, we booked you for, you know, we, we did some training for like 10 or 15,000 with you is when they get into the fourth quarter, many times say, how's your training budget coming for 22? I know a lot of companies are starting to plan their expenditures. You got to know the timing and say, hey, um, let's do some more. And and sometimes they go, you know, we got an extra 15, 20 grand in our training budget. Let's use it, Jake. You just got to remind them. So a lot of times we sell ourselves short. I know it because I've done it in my past. They go, wow, um, one of my biggest training contracts was a big real estate company. It was over six figures for about a four-month assignment. And I realized now, okay, I have other training clients in the real estate space that have budgets just as big. I just have to remember those success stories with that former client. So I talked to the new real estate company to share that story and be able to ask for that. So I'm giving some advanced stuff there, but you never know what level of folks are listening. You want to do some beginning, some mid-level, and some advanced items of knowledge. Yeah. I love that idea that a buyer is a buyer is a buyer. Cause sometimes we get caught up in, well, that's not a very big payday or, or, or they just want to buy that many books or they just want to do this and we don't take it seriously, but some people need to dip their toe in uh, the shallow end of the pool. Yeah. Yes. Some people are going to be a jumping in the deep end, but a lot of people need to just kind of test out the waters a little bit. So be okay with that. Let them do that. Has there ever been a single moment? Is there any single moment in your business career that changed the trajectory moving forward? I've never been asked that, Jake. I would say there was one central one that's going to come up tomorrow. Okay. Mm, so we're going to do great. a lot of real time here. Um, it's how much you want to ask and how, it, forgive me here, you can edit this later. Are you prepared? Yep, I'm prepared. How big of balls do you have? (laughs) Have a phone call tomorrow with an agent because of confidential, I'm not going to name, that works with the best in the world, like billions of books sold. We have a phone call with our team at 6.30 tomorrow. If this phone call goes well, which to get a phone call with this person, he's a a gentleman, um, is the biggest phone call in my 17 years. Mm. So I I don't want to look too far in the past, but this is like the next projection of like a level that we could go to. And the whole premise was the book I mentioned, Positive Disruption, we've sold thousands of them, is now let's sell hundreds of thousands of them. This guy can do it. And I don't ignore my intuition anymore, Jake. It moved very quickly. And I acted on the prompting and went and you know, kept hearing his name, researched him, dropped him an email, mailed him a book right away out to California. And he responded to us right away. I'm like, holy cow. Because a lot of authors, hundreds per week, try to get his attention to look at their manuscripts. So that could be the next big breakthrough. And um, you have to stay tuned for another interview on that one. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear that. And, and you know, one thing too is like, I don't remember exactly what you said, but you said something that made it sound like it's expanding your horizon, even if it doesn't go the way that, that you hope it goes, just asking the question. Now, all of a sudden, you're in a new realm. You're in a new realm of conversations. And that that right there is, is huge. I mean, that is such a big thing. In, in that success of that first year, but then also moving forward, how much has mindset played a part in your, your overall success? To me, it's everything. Um, there are some years looking back, a little bit of historical, that the mindset was off. Um, it, it throws everything out of whack. My biggest year as a speaker, um, 2017, I also had a major setback where I admitted I needed some help with an addiction. And it was like a tale of two Tonys. Biggest year revenue-wise, but also a a crumbling of my personal life all at the same time. Mm. And the show goes on, Jake. I was touring with a big real estate company and I was going right into recovery. They had no idea I was doing this. And I look back now, four and a half years later coming up and go, 
wow, sometimes your opportunity hits when you least expect it. And, and you have to be able to move through that adversity. So I don't know. Um, it's a, you asked some really good questions, dude. <laughs> I've never asked these. So I hope that gives you a little hint. No, that, that makes total sense. I just think that, you know, both of us being uh, students of Tony Robbins, he talks about the success is uh, 20% strategy and 80% psychology. Yeah. And I have found that to be so true, especially I found that to be true for myself. But then as I work with clients, it's so apparent to me. They'll come to me saying that my problem is I don't know what to do. But once mm-hmm. we get through the blocks that are holding them back, we get through the psychology, we get through and, and get their mindset right. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, they already know the answer. They just, they're just saying, why isn't it working? And what they realize is that the it in the sentence is me. Why aren't I working is the real, the real answer. Um, so I think that it's, it's everything. I think it's absolutely everything. Well, I, I want to add on the mindset. I think in the age of social media, you have to realize you're going into, you can't be afraid to offend people. Um, mm-hmm. If we're in a very PC world, Jake, and a lot of times when I do a keynote or a talk, the first minute or two, I talk about, hey, I'm going to say something that might offend you. Uh, some things you're going to agree, you're going to disagree. You might be mad at me. You might laugh the next minute. Are we all adults? And I get them to agree for me to offend them. Mm-hmm. Now, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but when you give strong opinions, um, it's setting the expectation of the audience that you're not there to sugarcoat. And, and this long in the game, um, it's not like cockiness. I just feel like I, I got to speak real me. And sometimes I say stuff on stage. You probably have this where you're like, where did that come from? Occasionally I drop a swear word. I don't drop F bombs in front of live audience, but I occasionally get someone to say, you said damn it, or you said this. I'm like, sorry, I, I, I'm no longer going to worry about that to the nth degree. Now, however, on the other side, if I keep hearing feedback of something that's not working, you might want to throw it out. I will look at it and take it out. Pattern. Not, that's pattern. Yeah, it's the patterns of saying, hey, if this is hurting my ability to influence or clients are really not liking it, and I see it consistently, um, or close people in a circle that I trust their opinion is to help, then I will look at it. So it's not like I just do whatever I want my way, like Frank Sinatra. There's a balancing act of also knowing your market. And if the meeting partner says, hey, you might want to reconsider that and they're respected, I will look at that opinion very highly. Mm, I love that. So. that that's, that's a really, really great piece of advice. Well, this has been great. I could talk to you all day, Tony. Uh, sure. I, I wanted to just finish with what, what's your last piece of advice for the entrepreneurs watching this who want to build and grow their businesses? Be coachable. You know, you never stop learning. Um, there are times through the pandemic, I was like, you know, damn, I, I should be doing better. Man, I, I can't believe, you know, 17 years in, I'm, I, I, there's no work right now. And it's being coachable so you don't quit, Jake. It's mm. getting around like-minded people and peers like Facebook groups, reading books, YouTube videos, mastermind calls to keep you pushing through um, because hopefully we never have this again where we have everything stop. So I think if you're coachable and you're willing to keep learning, um, the last year in many respects of my life, I feel like I've learned uh, like 10 years worth of knowledge. Mm. And I just think, wow, there were very cool benefits of being off the road. And the new book, which I'm really into a lot, may have never gotten written because it was like, oh, someday I'll do it as a fun book. Fun book got moved to priority book. And now it's taking off in ways I never imagined. So be coachable. And going back to mindset, a second tip is you've got to watch your mind. Um, again, you and I are very biased, but a shitty attitude does not attract good clients, Jake. It, and it doesn't get referrals. So as much as people joke about you and I being positive in our industry, people are drawn to the energy. You can't lead from a stage unless you believe in your message and yourself. And the audience will read energy. They can read energy dynamics. So positivity in our industry is where you've got to be. Yes. Love that. Tony, what's the best way for people to, get, to uh, find out more about you? Yeah. Um, simplest way is my website, mindcapturegroup.com. Facebook is a lot of where we market as mind captures one of our pages, but uh, no, it's, uh, those are the two quickest ways. And we use a lot of Facebook marketing. That's why I mentioned mind captured our business page. Awesome. Love it. Well, thank you cool. so much, Tony. This has been awesome. Give me a virtual fist bump to end here. Boom. There you go. Thank you so much. That's a first Thanks for me. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you guys later. 
Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope that you got something great out of it. I hope that you enjoyed it. And most importantly, I hope that you found something that you can apply. Success is not given to just the talented or the lucky. Success is given to those who are willing to take action. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with somebody else who would enjoy it. And if you would like all five parts of the Number One Goal five-part fundamental video series, head over to yournumberonegoal.com. That's all spelled out, yournumberonegoal.com. Thanks so much for listening. This is Jake Ballantyne with Mountaintop Motivation, and I will see you at the top.